into a dangerous and chaotic mind. My mind. <laughs> I'm a cartoonist. Now I have this theory that we're all born artists. If you look back and chart the evolution of mankind, you'll find it. Cave paintings, hieroglyphics, etchings in the stone. And if you look back into your own life, maybe you remember drawing as a child. Maybe your refrigerator became a gallery to your own personal masterpieces. And maybe at some point in your life, you moved on, pursued other interests. But there are times you catch yourself doodling, maybe during a mindless conference call when your brain's gone idle and reverted to its caveman roots. Me, I stuck with it. And much like that child version of myself, I use my art to continually ask why, why, but why? <laughs> and to question the status quo. For I'm not just a cartoonist, but I'm a political cartoonist here in Charleston for the local alternative weekly. Now I know what you're thinking, political cartoonist, politics, Democrats, Republicans, and yes, donkeys, elephants, crudely drawn politicians, they're all part of my repertoire. And let's face it, we live in a country where partisan bickering ground us to a halt. And thus, us in this, in this room are lucky enough to be in a state where politicians often make headlines for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> but despite those easy targets, any topic from a major global crisis to a local dispute is fair game. Take, for example, Ebola. Not what one would call a laughing matter. It's a horrific disease, but until late last year, the average American probably did, didn't give it much of a second thought. They knew about it, it was on their radar, but seemed far away. In underdeveloped countries, far off the shores from the States. We here in the States, we, see, we felt fairly quarantined. Until suddenly, we weren't. And you turn on the news, and there was a story. Someone with Ebola here in the States. And not long after, you turn on the news again, and there's another one, and another one. And there's a potential case over here, and there's someone confirmed over here, and suddenly, in your mind's eye, as the story progressed, you're mapping it out in your head. There's the United States, little red dots blooming wherever there's a confirmed or potential victim. And you go, okay, I've seen enough movies to know where this is headed. <laughs> we're on the brink of a zombie apocalypse. Or this time next week, we're going to be kneeling down before our chimpanzee overlords. <laughs> and that's about the time maybe you started to panic. Now, to be fair, the CDC was out there saying there's no need to panic. Everything's under control. It's a very small, insignificant number. Just be calm. Be smart. If you travel, be a little extra cautious. But really, there's no need to worry. But yet, you probably worried. It may have been just as simple as giving someone the side eye, maybe stepping aside just a little bit if they coughed or sneezed in your vicinity. Worst case, you went to Costco, figured out how much antibacterial gel you could fit in that cart <laughs> so you could take it home, fill up your bathtub, get a nice full body immersion. <laughs> but you were panicked, right? We were all a little worried. When you step back and look at that issue, you realize you were panicked because it was on the news. It was on the news every night. And as the story progressed, the evening news became like Ebola hour. And on cable news, with a 24-hour news cycle, forget about it, it was crazy town. You had Fox News, they had unleashed their bevy of wands to track every single potential victim, their travels on bowling night. And on CNN, you had Wolf Blitzer battling giant holographic Ebola strains. It was pretty nuts. And you step back a little bit further, you realize, well, no wonder they were doing that. Ebola was ratings gold. Who needs to watch reality TV or The Walking Dead when there's this perfect mashup going on, you know, 12 channels down? That's what a satirist does on a daily basis. Look at those big issues that have us talking, the hashtags trending on social media. Step back, look at them, pick at them. Not to be mean or malicious, we're just trying to find the irony, the flaw, the part, that little loose strand that can unravel the whole thing. Like that well-intentioned friend, though. It's all out of, you know, concern. 
really the friend who kind of goes, that mole on your face, you should get that checked out. It could be cancerous. <laughs> now as a cartoonist, I do this in a very small little space. My strip runs about four inches across, three to four inches tall, depending on how verbose the columnist was that week. That's small to fit in your pocket. And you read this cartoon differently than you would a column. When you read a blog post or an article, you consume it bite by bite, paragraph by paragraph. You kind of spoon feed it to yourself. And you consider each bite. And you can go, yes, I agree with this person, or no, I, I disagree, and here's my counter argument. And each bite colors the next. And by the end of the article, you've got your conclusion that yes, this guy's on target, or no, this guy's full of it. With a cartoon, it's small, it's tiny, it's visual. You consume that in a matter of seconds. And in those seconds, you get a topic, an opinion, and a punchline that will either make you laugh or piss you off, depending on where you stand on the issue. It's not a spoon feeding, it's a pie in the face. And there's power in that. And to be honest, it's a power that I myself have taken for granted. But I was reminded of that power earlier this year when looking for the story of the week, the topic that had us all talking, the hashtags, train on social media. And these two words were popping up. Now obviously, when mass extremists stormed this Parisian satirical magazine, and shot dead more political cartoonists than major American newspapers have on staff put together. It wasn't a local issue, but it hit very close to home. It was a moment when satirists and cartoonists stepped back, looked at that issue of the day, and saw themselves. Satire itself was the big debate. What is the purpose of satire? What's it good for? Is it worth the risk? Were we going to start putting labels on satirical content like we do cigarette packages? This here could be dangerous to your health. It has proved fatal. But if you step back and pick at the issue like a satirist would, you realize, oddly enough, satirists and terrorists were kind of two sides of the same coin. We we're both provocateurs, and we both find issue in the world around us and point it out. But while satirist does this to bring awareness to the issue, to help drive the conversation, to make us all stop and think, well, a terrorist does it to promote fear. And if that's their main goal, then what's to say they won't find reason and excuses for violence and chaos and the most innocuous things? Who's to say that in the effort to you know, quell someone they find issue with, say, freedom of speech, personal liberty. They won't look at the Sunday funnies and in a bearded likeness of Hagar the Horrible claim to find an offensive caricature, a religious figure. These are the kind of issues that satirists point out. I love being a cartoonist. It's a fun gig. It's proven a little dangerous and chaotic than I thought it would be but I wouldn't change it. Like the hashtags were trending following the Paris attack, Zay Shui Charlie, I am Charlie, I'm a satirist, I'm a cartoonist, and I walk this tightrope every week so we all stop and think and maybe laugh. Thank you very much. <laughs>